So here you are, you're in your early 20s, I guess, in a foreign country, living in a castle, pregnant, and you have decided that they need to change what they eat. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I mean, well, I, I thought I could be helpful. You know? <laughs> Welcome to the Deep Culture Podcast. I am your host, Joseph Scholz. Yvonne Vanderpoel is away. You know, before information technology, before we Zoomed and Googled, before we were friending on Facebook and live streaming our living room, living in a foreign country was even more intense than today. It really cut you off and you were forced to dive into a different world. For many years, during that pre-information technology era, foreign residents in Japan had a kind of lifeline to help them adjust. Every week, the Japan Times published a column by Karen Hill Anton called Crossing Cultures. Karen and her husband Bill had arrived in Japan in 1975 and moved to a remote mountaintop farmhouse in Shizuoka Prefecture where they built a fire every day to heat their bath water, and where they raised their four children in a traditional farming community. Karen's dispatches from rural Japan introduced her readers to the very local life that she lived, her farmhouse neighbors, the PTA, and the million and one cultural adjustments she had to make, raising her children in a world so far away from her working class New York City upbringing. Her column gave voice to the challenges and rewards of intercultural living. She developed a wildly dedicated following of people who would write to her, ask her advice, confide in her, and she would share these stories. She also went on to become an intercultural trainer and consultant and is still living in rural Japan. Today on the Deep Culture Podcast, we have a special treat. I will be talking to Karen Hill Anton about her new memoir, The View from Breast Pocket Mountain. Karen Hill Anton, welcome to the Deep Culture Podcast. Thank you very much, Joseph Scholz. I'm very happy to be here. I sometimes tell people that the first intercultural writing that I ever came across was Edward Hall when I was in graduate school, but that's not really true because the first intercultural writing that I came across was your Crossing Cultures column in the Japan Times. This was something I looked forward to every week. And I know in your memoir, you talk about writing the column and all of the loyal readers you had and all of the letters that they wrote to you, what was that column and what were you trying to accomplish and what did that mean for you? Well, the the column Crossing Cultures, it occurred to me that people would be interested in reading about the experiences, the life of an American woman married to an American living in rural Japan, raising four children and participating in society and community here at, at every level. I, I wrote the column, I mean, the editor, and she wasn't particularly enthusiastic, I, I recall. She, she just said, show me something. And I wrote something, and that became the first column, and it was, it was a hit. You were writing about daily life, living in this rural community with the wives of the farmers in your neighborhood and your kids going to school. So it was very local. But at the same time, there was something universal about it. Yeah, I think so, because I think almost anyone, even you know, someone who was not having this experience, could put themselves in this position. Like, what if they had and ended up living in this kind of, you know, small uh, community? Well, you had some pretty extreme cultural adaptation. Arriving in Japan and living in a, a dojo, living in a, what's this, a yoga community, yeah, and then so. living in this farmhouse. 
And then you've been, of course, living in Japan for many, many years now and have a very strong sense of attachment here. I'm very interested in community and what is it that makes us feel attached to community, but also why do we leave the Mm. communities that we do? Now, you're originally from New York. Well, I'm from New York City. I grew up in Washington Heights, which is is uptown in Manhattan. Growing up in the 50s and the 60s, it was... uh, I guess a somewhat you know, typical black community. Uh, my high school was uh, probably quarter black, quarter Jewish, quarter Puerto Rican, quarter Greek. But it was, yeah, uh, it was working class. I mean, you might even say poor, but we had the things we, we needed. We had um, a community uh, where everyone was pretty much you know, an active uh, participant. And I write in the memoir how my father was actually the founder of what was called the Community League of 159th Street. They would arrange outings and block parties. Well, your father sounds like a remarkable man. You talk about him owning the only typewriter and people would come to him and ask him to write letters. He had a royal typewriter. It was a large, black, very heavy thing. You know, people would sometimes come to our apartment and ask him to to write a uh, anything that needed, you know, to uh, be official. And sometimes he would take it to other people's apartments. And, you know, these were, you know, tenements. So there are no elevators. He'd carry that out, the the typewriter, you know, down our stairs and up someone else's, you know, five flights. And, you know, and write, you know, whatever um, they they needed written. Well, it's struck me as I was reading your memoir that there are these parallels in your life with you and your father. He was, he obviously loved language and you talk about his interest in art, showing you the Pieta or loving Handel. I don't know where or how, I mean, he, he came to know the, the music of, of Handel or, or, or to love the music of Handel. And I remember the very first time, and, and I don't write about this uh, in, in the memoir, when he said something to me about how beautiful the music was. And he said the name Hundo. And I just remember thinking at the time, how can someone's name be, you know, Handel? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Handel, Handel is on the door, you know, whatever. And it, I do mention that he went to the Hampton Institute, but Hampton Institute was founded to educate Negroes and Indians and to give them the skills to be able to be productive members of society. It's not like he had a liberal arts education. You know, he was someone who was curious and interested, read newspapers from the very first page to the last. So you had a strong sense of community uh, where you grew up, but then you moved to Greenwich Village. Was this after you left high school? That sounds like a very different kind of world. It was a very different world. It couldn't have been more different. I was beginning to see more of the world outside of my small community. And this was through, you know, taking a a art history course that that exposed me and and, my classmates to much of the great art, you know, that could be found in the world. And once you start opening, you know, these doors, these windows, in the, you know, there's, a, there's a, a whole world to be found. And in a place like Greenwich Village, where the home of, you know, bohemians and artists and writers and dancers, performers, you know, galleries and, you know, unusual stores and, you know, crafts people that live there. It, it was, in, in a way, a, you know, just a perfect environment for someone looking to explore and, and see a different world. My guest today is Karen Hill Anton. In her memoir, The View from Breast Pocket Mountain, She talks about how living in Greenwich Village was the starting point for her life of artistic self-expression and exchange. She danced at the Martha Graham Dance Academy, 
met artists and writers. Her neighbor was the author Joseph Heller, and she got a job typing out the dialogue of his novel, Catch-22. Later, living in Copenhagen, she was part of a jazz community that included Dexter Gordon, Freddie Hubbard, Kenny Drew. In Switzerland, she spent the afternoon with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. In Japan, John Denver came to her farmhouse and sang for her neighbors. She has practiced shodo, Japanese calligraphy, for many years. And of course, she's an accomplished writer. We can't fit all of this into our podcast, but at least let's hear some more about her intercultural adventures. So your first experience outside of the United States was when you went to Europe, is that right? That's correct. When I was 19, I went to Europe for the first time. Just took off. You know, the whole world opened up as far as I was concerned. I hitchhiked, you know, the length and breadth of France and Spain, Germany. I went into Belgium. I went to Denmark, I think, twice. Um, I also went to, to Morocco just for a short time. But I I, I ran, I felt like I was running all, all over the place in, in a way. Taking it all in, it was just so exciting. And I just absolutely loved it. In your memoir, you said, the first experience of living outside the United States changed me in ways I don't even know how to describe. Probably I would say that I realized that there was so much more than what I had been exposed to. I saw, interacted with, and and could appreciate that there was an entire world of of experience, of art, of food, of clothes, of ways to live, um, communicate, that I had no inkling of before. I felt I could absorb it like a sponge almost. And everything had meaning for me. I was definitely very much affected by, by absolutely everything that, that I was experiencing. So you came back to New York. Then there was uh, you were working as a model in New York. I was 66. I knew I got some modeling jobs. You know, I was somewhat fortunate. I got a few good assignments. I actually modeled for the first color uh, edition of the, the fashion pages for the New York Times magazine. So was this at a time when there were increasing numbers of models of color? Yeah, there, there were more uh, black models at that time than, than certainly than there had been previously. But when I say more, I you know, of the top models, instead of one, maybe there was two. I recall that I was introduced to a major modeling agency, and I, you know, I went there with, with, with this introduction. And was told that we already have a black model. That, that they had one, and that was enough. But I also knew the world of modeling uh, wasn't for me. And and one of the reasons uh, I'll tell you, Joseph, is that that summer I had worked in a summer camp for disadvantaged children, and I was paid to work as a counselor, and I I was paid for the entire summer what I made modeling in a few hours. Mm. And I just realized that's, you know, I didn't really want to participate in, in anything like that. After years in Europe, traveling, living in a castle on a strawberry farm, in cosmopolitan Copenhagen, my guest, Karen Hill Anton, went back to the U.S. and spent four years living in rural Vermont before hitting the road again, exploring Europe and heading overland to Asia in an old Volkswagen bug with her partner, Bill, and her four-year-old daughter, and eventually making it to Japan. So you later were living in San Francisco, but then you went back to Europe. And I was fascinated to learn that you were working as a cook at a Danish high school when you were pregnant. That's right. (laughs) I was, I think, about four months pregnant when I arrived in, in Denmark. 
and I had heard of this uh, that there was a position open. They were looking for a cook, and and it, it sounded like some place where I you know I'd be able to get through the, the winter, you know, and, and through my pregnancy. When when I arrived at the school, I was aware that they were eating the typical Danish diet. And at that time, you could say the typical Danish diet was meat and potatoes. And meat and potatoes. <laughs> and, and I was a vegetarian at the time. And I spoke with the headmaster and you know, told them that I would, you know, would like to but introduce them to the idea even that you could have a perfectly healthy and delicious meal without meat. He basically said, sure. The job is yours, you know, take it over. Well, let's just clarify, too, that this was basically in a castle on an island. It was on the island of Hume. And the castle was still outside of Odense, way out in, in, in the countryside, in, in a place where it literally did not have an address. If you wrote to someone at the high school, you would say, Père Homsbro, which it means near the, the village of Homsbro. And the castle, yeah, was, uh, I believe it was built in the 1860s. And I guess for a castle, it was a small castle, but it you know, probably, yeah, probably had 40 rooms or something like that. So here you are, you're in your early 20s, I guess, in a foreign country, living in a castle, pregnant, and you have decided that they need to change what they eat. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I mean, well, I, I thought I could be helpful. You know? <laughs> I was impressed that you had this clear vision in your own mind. And, you know, there's a, a contradiction when we go out and explore the world. You, you mm -hmm. need to have some sense of who you are to want to go out and see the world. You need to have your own vision. At the same time, you're going into other people's communities, other people's homes, and you, exactly. you need to adapt yourself. So there's always this conflict between being yourself and adapting to others. And so that was really a unique situation. It was. Yeah, and I, and, and I believe there is always that give and take. I said, just said, you know, okay, you know, I can make some of those things and I'll make it better, in fact, than, than what uh, you've had. I'll also introduce you to, to uh, some other ways of eating. And I'll revive some traditional Danish um, dishes, you know, just even something like pickled herring. I could get, you know, the herring from the fishmonger and I, I found a recipe, an, an old recipe for pickling herring. And yeah, it was simple enough and, and I pickled herring. So you got together with your now husband, then boyfriend, Bill Anton, and then you decide to go, both of you decide to go to Japan. And in, this was, what, 1975? Uh, 74 is when we, we left the United States. Bill was invited to Japan. He was invited to study at this yoga dojo uh, where yoga and martial arts and healing arts were, were taught. But you decided not to just fly directly. You decided to drive across Europe towards Japan. How long did that take you and where did you go? One year, one year. Um, yeah, we, well, we flew from New York to Belgium and we, we toured, I would say, all of Western Europe. We drove like, straight across northern Italy into the former Yugoslavia, and then from there into Bulgaria, then Turkey, Iran, and Afghanistan. After that, we used public transportation to go through Pakistan, India, Nepal, and Thailand. And the drive was all, all in a Volkswagen bug, an old Volkswagen bug, and with a five-year-old child. Yeah. This is some, some <laughs> hardcore travel. It is, yeah. When you think about it now, you could not imagine, you know, driving overland 
border to border in Iran and Afghanistan. I mean, you, you, you wouldn't do it, and two, you couldn't do it. It's, it's, it's no longer possible. But then it was it really wasn't a scary thing. I mean, if I'd been afraid, I, I'm sure I wouldn't ha- have done it. But it sounds like you got a lot of attention wherever you went. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I was stared at. <laughs> You know, from the moment we left Europe, I w- was stared at all the time, absolutely all the time. Was that because you're black, because you're a woman, because you're a foreigner, or because you had a child, because you're a, a mixed race couple, you know? Really, it was all those things, Joseph. Uh, probably not the last one, though. I, I doubt that, you know, the fact that we were a mixed race couple, but the f- just being so different. You know, we were just obviously different wherever we went. Um, I was even more different, you know, uh, being black. And yeah, and in places, you know, where women were not out on their own, like Afghanistan, it was almost like a revelation every time I stepped forward. Then you arrived in Japan, and whereas you had been on the road for, I guess, a year um, you know, camping next to your car, I understand. Right, right. But you arrive in Japan and you move into a yoga community. And getting to the dojo, and, and this is after being you know, on the road for a, a full year, it was a welcome respite to be in a place where you knew you'd be sleeping in the same place. <clears throat> You knew what time you're going to wake up, what time you the lights went out, what you you were going to eat, and pretty much what was expected of you all day long. Meal times were set. You know, breakfast was at I don't know six thirty or seven, lunch at twelve, dinner at five. I mean, it didn't it didn't change. <laughs> there was there was no variation in it. Well, none whatsoever. And we all wore the same um, training suit. It, it was blue. And everyone was dressed the same. And so you just, you know, you fit in. And it, it, it was very comfortable. It, 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 in, in one, one uh, sense, it was uh, very comfortable. But at the same time, you are in Japan for the first time. Japan has a very hierarchical uh, society, and it sounds like that community had very clear lines of authority and not a lot of individual freedom. So going from being this kind of artistic individualist to the, a part of this very structured community seems to me one of the most difficult kind of adaptive challenges I can imagine. It, it was, uh, that part of it w- was probably uh, the, the most difficult. It was a community of trainees and they accepted and did what was expected of them. And, you know, following the teachers, the teachings of the, the, the sensei, the, the, the master, and also the, the fact that the sensei, he had absolute control And in that sense, he had absolute power. He could be absolutely tyrannical. So you ended up leaving this community, and this is when you moved to a farmhouse in Futokoroyama. And in your memoir, you have some photographs. There's one of you with a baby strapped to your back on one of the, with one of these traditional uh, baby carriers. There's another photo of cleaning the pit toilet. It sounds like an extreme rural environment in Japan. Can you describe your life? We didn't think of it as extreme at the time. You know, when we found the farmhouse, I mean, both Bill and I said, we looked at it and just said, oh, this is it. 
oh, now we found the real Japan or something. And of course, I mean, we were complete novices and, you know, didn't know anything. You couldn't tell us that not everyone in Japan was emptying their own toilet or didn't have, you know, hot water <laughs> or was building a fire to, to heat the, the bath. You know, we just accepted, oh, this all, oh, this is a Japanese way of life. And we knew we wanted you know, to live in, in, in the countryside if we just stayed in Japan. The house had uh, challenges, to, to say the very least, but we're very young, perfectly willing you know, to, to put up with all of those uh, inconveniences, which we did for seven years. When I think about it now, <laughs> I can tell you, there's no way I would do something like that. Absolutely not. You know, there's like, I, I have a bath now, just like I push a button <laughs> and you know, it fills up and, and heats up and maintains the temperature. Then I was building a fire for the bath every night. It, it was quite quite an, an experience. And you were raising a family. And raising a family, right. There's an attraction to going somewhere exotic and then seeing if you can stay there. However, that there's a point at which it stops being exotic. And you, you have to transition to it being your normal everyday life. And the more exotic it feels when you arrive, the more difficult it would be to actually stay there and form connections. Mm -hmm. But you did stay there and you decided to to stay and and raise your family. So you were raising your children uh, in Japan in this rural environment. Talk a little more about becoming a part of that community Mm -hmm. such that it started to become home. I think something is exotic as long as it if it stays strange. I mean, if it's new and stays strange. But I felt after a sh- relatively short time, what was certainly unusual for me or an unknown, it became part of my daily life. You build a, a fire to, to heat your bath. You, you know, keep warm by sitting at a sumi horikotatsu. You don't have hot water, and, and that's um, how you know, life can be lived. I feel that you know, having children in a small community like this, you almost had an immediate in because there's so much of what is part of children's lives brings the, the family into the community. School sports day, uh, the PTA, the uh, children's associations, all of these things and, and interacting you know, w- with other mothers. This was really a way to, to get deeper in, into the society uh, and the community. Yeah, I perfectly understood what was expected of me. And I know if nothing else, I was expected to cooperate. And, and I did. I know that... Japan is not an easy society to become an insider. Uh, and part of that is that it's, a, even today, it's it's very collectivist compared to the West. And human relations uh, often revolve around a sense of responsibility, to responsibility to the family, to the community, whether it's the PTA or, you know, the school volunteer board or being expected to work late or whatever it is. And this was a farming community, right? Oh, Which I yeah. think has to be some of the most traditional in terms of these kinds of social responsibilities. So how was it for you to kind of fit into this network of obligation? What can I say? There were you know, times when I thought, oh, goodness, no, <laughs> I don't want to do this thing. You know, go cut weeds on the side of the road or be the traffic monitor or whatever the the thing was. But at the same time, I could just totally accept as a member of the community, it's my turn. It's my turn. And that's all that that mattered. And it it wasn't, you know, that I thought, oh, this is how I will gain acceptance it, it was also clear that there was no other way to do this. I was not part of a Japanese family. At the same time, I f- felt my neighbors, especially my uh, farmer neighbors, reciprocated. I, you know, I was always uh, given vegetables, uh, uh, green tea. 
Yeah, they were just um, just some of the nicest, kindest, most generous people you know I, I've ever met. I remember when my second daughter school from her kindergarten was having a recital, and she was in the recital, and I knew all of the grandmothers would be there, and I invited three of my neighbors, Oisan, Otani-san, and Oraisan, all farmer ladies, and they accepted the invitation. They dressed in kimono and came and and it's one of my favorite photographs, and it's one of the most precious photos in, in the world to me because I just felt, yeah, I, I had their support in that sense, and, and I, I was very glad for it. Still, deep, deep feelings of gratitude for the people they were. And this takes us back to this contradiction that we have to be ourselves and we also have to adapt to others. And I don't think that those are opposing things. I agree with you. And and I feel, and this is something that you gain from living interculturally, and that is that you can be yourself. You don't lose anything, but you can, you take something else on and, and a person you didn't even know you were or could be. And that you can, you know, learn to to balance these things and switch these things and have these things color your relationships, but without thinking, oh, I'm being a phony in this situation, or that's not the real me or or something. Now I I realize, I mean, they're both the real me. You know, I I feel like I've gained something from that. One of the things that I like about your memoir that I really appreciated was that you also talk very openly about, you know, long periods of very stressful isolation, feeling, you know, physically isolated, you know, very little physical contact in Japan, culturally isolated, linguistically isolated. And I I think that's something that many people who live interculturally can relate to, but it's something that's hard to talk about because if you have not been in that kind of situation, it's hard to understand how distressing it can be. I mean, I I certainly didn't want to over-dramatize it, but as you say, I was isolated in one sense in, in the culture and by the language but also by the, my very physical, the circumstance of living, you know, at the top of a mountain in, in a, you know, a rural farming village. I mean, there was no one to talk, ever. While that can be a nice experience sometimes, but but not when you don't want it. <laughs> you know? it's, like, it's not like I wanted to be, you know, completely uh, alone, but I, you know, I was alone a, a, a lot. And yeah, I, and I am an independent person, and you know, I can, I, but still, to be without uh, human contact was uh, a really big thing. Well, it, it strikes me, um, you know, in your memoir, you talk about having had violent death in your family, uh, having had a uh, little relationship with your mother, and things which are traumatizing. Mm. in this act of of adapting to this very foreign culture, but then creating a rich family life. You know, at, somehow you came back to yourself. You come back full circle. Mm. Uh, and I really appreciated in your memoir your willingness to be open about that journey. I wanted to, I guess moderate the experience of how people might perceive me. Particularly, I would say, for some of my crossing culture readers. And, you know, I had a you know, dedicated uh, readership of that column. But I felt, you know, you don't know the whole story. You don't know everything. You know, you, you know what I'm writing about for this 500-word column for the Japan Times. There, there is more. There, there is quite a bit more. One issue that many expatriates deal with is how their children will fit into the society that they're growing up in, or immigrants as well, of course. 
So your children are obviously highly international, but they also grew up locally in mm -hmm. Japan. How is their sense of home and self and international self or intercultural self similar or different to yours? From my perspective, I feel they all appear to me to have made their place, you know, have have come to yeah, acceptance of themselves. I mean, they have American passports. They accept that if they're called American, that that label might uh, might not uh, fit. Uh, they have a black mother and a white father, and they may be called black, but that label, uh, certainly in my estimation, does not fit. They might not have the the identity, the total identity of the, the country where, where they were born, but that's also part of who they are. They've all studied abroad. The eldest studied in Mexico. Mias, uh, that was Nanao, studied in Mexico. Mias uh, studied in China. Mario in Ecuador. Lila in Ghana. That's who they are. They you know, they are literally children born with passports, and I, I feel they've been, em, embraced that, that life. You use the words, they've found their place. And that really says something, because mm -hmm. you are someone who traveled a lot and came to a very different place, but you found your place and you created a home. And then they started there, but then have gone out into the world and they have found their place. That sounds like quite a legacy. Yeah, I think so. Karen Hill Anton, thank you so much for spending this time with me. It has been a great pleasure. Karen Hill Anton's memoir is The View from Breast Pocket Mountain. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joseph, for inviting me to be on your podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for listening to the Deep Culture Podcast. It's sponsored by JII, the Japan Intercultural Institute, and I'm the director of JII. We are an NPO working towards deeper forms of intercultural understanding. Check out our Brain, Mind, and Culture Masterclass. Just search for the Japan Intercultural Institute. You can find us on LinkedIn. Please subscribe to this podcast or get in touch by email dcpodcast at japanintercultural.org. Our sound engineer is Robinson Fritz. Chris Koyama is our production assistant. Thanks to both of you and to my co-host, Yvonne Vanderpoel. Hey, we really did get this thing going. Looking forward to spending time with you and all of our listeners on into 2021. Be well and see you next time. <laughs>